we're traveling close to the Tiwata Sloof Dam. This is our major dam that supply water to Cape Town. But also a, a large part of the water is reserved for irrigation. Normally you won't see this. This is the old trees that used to be next to the river before the dam was built. Now they've been underwater for, for close to 30 years now. And, and this is now the first time that they've really been exposed. This is really severe. It's estimated to be the worst drought in 100 years. Normally we expect that the dams fill up in, in winter and then we can bring them down to about 50% by the end of summer and then they can fill up again to 100%. But it hasn't happened for the last two years. So year upon year they're not filling up in they're winter when the up. rains come because they're just not enough rain. Not enough rain. So, so we won't ever go back to the good old days, if I can call it that, when there was ample water available. The majority of South Africa's farmers are smallholders and their crops are rain-fed. So when weather patterns are disrupted, it can have a devastating effect on their yields and livelihoods. Thomas Ngata is one such farmer living in the Boerland region. He has a small herd of goats, a few pigs, and is hoping to grow some guavas this year. But when I visit, his rain-fed reservoir is almost dry. Mm. Manje baninga abantu la South Africa baninga abantu emhlabeni so dinga ukuthi simane sifu uya kakhulu ukuthi sifide wonkuntu kuzo wenza ka kanjani kungekho imvula umbuzo wokuhlela wakho ma qha into ethi engozi esiyithandazelayo ma kungabi njalo yabona sihlale sine themba kuba climate change sithe ngoba lisitwe galus gis yabona ya ba ibiza ukushintsha mhlambe ehambeni kwexesha asisi asizwe yazi yabona umdali yento yazi yoba kuzwa kwenza kantoni kwakhulu yawa Since the 1990s South Africa has lost over a third of its farms largely due to water scarcity as the droughts become more severe and the boreholes dry up Farmers like Thomas are going to need a radical solution Professor Jill Farrant at the University of Cape Town is hoping to provide just that Jill's research focuses on a kind of plant with some extraordinary properties and she's ideally situated because one type grows wild in the hills just behind the university campus. This is it looks dead, doesn't it? It does. But it's not. It's actually it's dried, it's lost all its water and it's curled its its front into a very protective kind of way. How long can it survive like this? Ah, oh, months to years depending on the species. And the moment it rains, this thing will rehydrate within two hours. Within two hours, two even hours. after years. Yeah, after years. Wow! I've got one species. We kept them dry for ten years. Twelve hours later, they were alive. I'm trying to unlock the secrets of how these plants can actually lose all that amount of water and not die. So once you understand these plants better and unlock those secrets, what do you do with those secrets? I make crops do the same thing. Right. That's my intent. Mm -hmm. Jill takes me back to the lab where her team is busy unlocking the secrets of these so-called resurrection plants. I want to put this one on here okay. and then start the rewatering process so that you can see this magic of resurrection. Okay, so we just water the, the roots? The roots, but also give the leaves a little bit. It's like rain. Try and simulate rain. And the thing about farmers in Africa is that they all, all the agriculture is rain-fed. So those who can afford irrigation, great. But if there's no rain for the bulk of us, there's no crop. Again, the nice thing about this type of crop is that it will start off well if there's lots of rain. It will continue well if there's lots of rain. But should there be a drought, the plant won't die. When the next rain comes, it will continue growing. The farmer can at least get a harvest. Mm. And you can get another chance of life, as it were. Dr. Farron's team's first objective is to understand what gives these plants their unique properties. What we did here, it was like we extracted some of these proteins from one of the resurrection plants and we transferred these genes to the bacteria. So now we are trying to produce these uh, proteins in a large scale. 
So these proteins are part of the plant's arsenal to protect itself against the lack of water? Correct. Right. That is this little protein that we're looking at. Okay. In water, it has no structure whatsoever. As the plant's drying, the water molecules are disappearing, right. but this protein then falls and traps a whole lot of water mo molecules ah. inside it. So it retains its, it's water by water. changing shape? Correct. Right. Very intelligent system. You and I can run away from our challenges. They can't. They have to face every stress of their life, which is us eating them, insects eating them, fungi eating them, weather, salinity, hail, all of that. Mm. And they, they have these amazing ways of just recovering and responding. It's done its thing. Oh, wow. Yeah, look, it's resurrected. Oh, wow. Amazing to think that the plant that we saw earlier that looked dead, basically, now yep. looks completely alive. I mean, I'm just picturing a farmer's field where the maize is completely dead because there's been a drought season and then the rain finally comes again. And the next day it will look like that. The potential of that is staggering. The most promising crop for achieving resurrection is teff, a popular cereal throughout East Africa. But Jill's team recently had a big breakthrough. They were able to prove that the genes responsible for the regeneration process are already present in all plants. This gives a lot of hope for future drought-tolerant crops. For me, the important thing is to be able to leave this planet knowing I've started a process that can make a difference. Mm. A difference in Africa, the continent that I grew up in, the continent that I love. With long dry seasons and unpredictable rains, farms that can afford to irrigate their crops. Almost two-thirds of South Africa's total water requirements are used for irrigation. But in times of drought, severe restrictions are put in place, forcing farmers to become smarter with their water usage. The DeWitt family orchard, just outside Cape Town, produces around 70 million apples and pears each year and exports their produce around the world. Oh, Donny. Nice to meet oh. you. All right. Sure. Thank you for having us. No, pleasure. Pleasure. To ensure their orchards and business survive, the Davids need to be more precise with their water usage, and they're now able to call on a high-tech solution. So one of the new technologies we have is satellite imaging of our orchards. This is what it looks like. It's called Fruit Look. Fruit Look is a precision agriculture tool that helps farmers grow more with less. It analyzes satellite images, meteorological data, and available local data sets to provide near real-time accurate information about crop health. A satellite image can view crops in different light spectrums. The pixels can then be analyzed against crop models to identify a stressed crop before you can even see it with a visible eye. Farmers can react more precisely and quickly to any possible problems. So what does, what does the information tell us about what's happening on the farm right now? Here we can see there is a U-shape that is growing a bit weaker than the other ones. Which is a bit... So the, the yellow patches mean that that's not as good growth? Yes. Okay. I think we should go have a look. Okay, we so we can go see what's look. actually happening there. Fruit look can give you the early warning signs, even before the orchard starts showing. In my dad's generation, this was unthinkable. This is the orchard. Yeah. And that's fine. It's, its next irrigation is scheduled quite soon. Yeah. So it should be fine. So that should be yeah. fine. Yeah. So this part is okay. So we've got this to keep looking okay. and see where the problem is. Yes. A little further down, we test the soil again. You can see this is much more clay soil. It's, it's more yellowish. The holding capacity of the soil yeah. is weaker. Right. Yeah. So what will you do to make sure that this can catch up to some of the other orchards? On the next round of mulching. Yeah, definitely. We'll put some extra mulching here again. Yeah. More mulching allows for water to be held around the roots of the tree. Simply increasing irrigation would waste water as it drains off in the clay soil. Knowing this helps Paul manage the use of water more effectively in his orchard. 
10 years ago, you would have been happy with 50 tons per hectare. Our aim is now 80 to 100 tons. And it's just good farming practices and this new technology that's coming in to make us capable of more precise farming. Twisted. Yes. It's better to not pull it because then you get too much of that stem coming off with it. So if you want to get a clean break, you lift it up and over instead of pulling it down. It's incredible to think that the pears that we pick here today will be shipped all over the world to China, to the Middle East, and that the farmers, the workers who work here, are making food that will be eaten all over the world. It's important work that they're doing. Fruit Look is enabling farms to reduce their water usage by around 30%. Its successes have led the Agricultural Department of the Western Cape to offer Fruit Look for free to farmers in the region. Only those with the technical means to access Fruit Look are able to benefit from it, however. Thomas is installing some basic irrigation on his farm. This gives him some hope for the future. So, mm. Yeah.